That is great. So welcome to everybody, all of our guests around the world. My name is Mark Werwath. I'm the director of the MEM program here at Northwestern. I've been the director for about five years, and I've, I'm also an alum. I'm an alum from 1987. The program here is something close to 40 years old, and uh, we've got a great legacy here and a great tradition uh, and a great program. And I'm sure that uh, most of you have looked at that or know much about it. Tonight, we're simply going to be talking about considerations that you might have as an engineer becoming a manager, becoming a group leader, uh, things that you need to think about. Um, I know it's going to seem overwhelming, so I'll tell you that up front. There's a lot here, some of which is intuitive. Um, if you're already a manager, I suspect you've already done some of this, if not much of this. Uh, I can also tell you that I made myself personally a lot of mistakes that helped me uh, develop this deck. So this comes from both my lived experience as well as the stuff I was taught as a young uh, engineering group leader and engineering manager. Back in the day, companies would actually invest in uh, training new leaders and new managers. And I suspect that there's not as much investment these days, which is why we put this together. So again, um, things we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna include my background as well as some uh, key considerations for you and some examples so that you have some practical uh, uh, applications for this. My own personal experiences, stories that uh, if you will, tie all this together and then hopefully We'll have some time for some open discussion, some questions and concerns you might have. Um, I, I was in the workplace uh, for quite some time. I had almost 30 years of experience in engineering and new product development, uh, both at WMS Gaming, which was, believe it or not, a slot machine company. So I made slot machines, a highly regulated business. Most of my career was at Motorola, where I made everything from cellular phones to base station radios and large scale 911 systems. And I had a brief stint in aerospace at Northrop Grumman, uh, program managing uh, effectively a, 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 foreign defense, a de foreign defense contract with uh, Marconi of England. So that was a very uh, worthwhile and, and great experience. So I've managed large complex systems, product development, IT projects, manufacturing projects, radio network system implementations, and I've worked, of course, around the world. I am a PMP. Um, it's something that a lot of our students contemplate getting while they're in the program. And I, I do believe this program helps prepare you to a large extent for passing the exam and for being a, um, a project management professional. My main responsibilities is I've been the director now for about five years is to first and foremost, accept only the best students. So we're very selective here. We're probably as selective as, as some of the best MBA programs in the country. Uh, my, my second job is to keep the curriculum current, relevant, and properly de delivered by, by excellent faculty. My third job is to really network students to the community of seasoned professionals, to plug them in, so to speak. You don't come to Northwestern just to get a, a transfer of information. You don't come here just to get a few skills under your, under your belt. You also come to, to plug in and to network into the network of uh, professional engineers and engineering managers, right? The fourth bullet's gonna make you uncomfortable, and at first it kind of made me uncomfortable, but I'm here to stretch you, and I'm here to stretch you beyond what you normally would, would do in your day-to-day -day job. Um, everyone's very courteous in the corporate setting, and of course we're courteous here, but my job is to put you in settings that would um, uh, force you to look at things from a different perspective, uh, work in teams that uh, perhaps people you've never worked with before, on topics and on projects that you've never possibly seen before. So uh, stretch you in areas such as leadership and uh, emotional intelligence and things that are softer topics that most engineers never get exposed to unless they take a program like MEM. Um, my ultimate job, my final job, my, you know, my um, um, main job really is to turn, uh, turn you and to turn students into technology and engineering leaders. So. Uh, we do that through a series of uh, very, I guess, well-calculated experiences and courses and topics and faculty members that are very good at putting you through exercises, right? Um, the first concept, I guess, or the first um, thing you need to deal with as a new leader, and I'm assuming for this purpose that really you've become a leader for the first time. It may or may not be the organization that you were working in. It could be a new organization, right? 
And if it is, the first issue is going to be credibility. You are the outsider. You are coming into an organization that doesn't know who you are or what you're capable of. So your history, your background, and your accomplishments are all part of the credibility puzzle, if you will, that people are trying to assemble on your behalf. They're trying to uh, understand if what you say is really worth listening to. They want to know who you're connected to, your network, who are your senior level supporters, why do they support you. But they also, and I hate to say this, but to some extent you will be judged. You'll be judged on your demeanor, your presence. Do people naturally want to pay attention to you? Are you worth you know, being listened to, I guess, right? Is, is there something that you have to say or perhaps the way you say it that uh, makes people stand up and take notice, right? And last but not least, especially with engineering, um, your knowledge, your judgment, your um, creativity, your ability to understand the system or the problem that's in front of you is going to be, uh, you know, first and foremost in people's minds. Are you really in the right position? Are you the right person to take on this job? Um, I'll never forget the day I took over uh, the GSM infrastructure business at uh, Motorola, and I was their biz ops executive director. And the first day on the job, I came into this conference room filled with engineers. And of course, most of them had their laptops open. And, um, you know, the current executive director turned to me and said, Mark, what do you think of of this organization? What's your first observation? And uh, luckily, I had one. It's not luck. It was skill. I knew that I had to have one. And my first uh, observation was that we had a serious problem with quality on uh, GSR-8, which was their system release that was going out the door. And um, he turned to me and he was surprised. He said, how did you know that? Or how did, what makes you think that? And I said, well, outside of this conference room is a quality chart. And that quality chart is going in the wrong direction. And it was clearly labeled GSR-8 and it was updated three days ago. And with that, everyone stopped and looked at me and said, wow, they didn't know that. So here I am, the new guy, one hour on the job. You could argue I literally had no, I shouldn't have any clue what was going on. And I was able to educate everyone in that room on something that everyone in that room should have known about. And uh, at the time, Motorola took quality very seriously. I think it still does. But um, I mean, you, I think I gained some credibility points that day. And some of that was certainly uh, by my design. I wanted to show these people that, I, hey, I might be new. I may not know exactly what's going on in all cases, but I am observant. I can read a chart. I've been around the uh, block before, and I know Motorola. So that came across that day. So you, too, will be tested. And that's my last bullet on this chart. You, too, will be tested. You'll be watched very carefully. I tell students in my leadership class, be used to and be um, – comfortable with the idea of being watched almost every step along the way, every word you say, how you say it, right, all the way down to um, who you have lunch with, because all of these things will be <laughs> will be looked at. And it sounds bizarre, but um, if you're not comfortable with that, if you don't like the idea that everything you say and do will be under a microscope, um, think twice about leadership, because frankly, that's just part of part of the job, whether you're a group leader on the job at at your company, or whether you're uh, president of your country, or anything in between, you'll find that uh, leaders are all looked at very carefully. So you're taking over a new organization, right? You should start by understanding your boss. Who is your boss? Who do you report to? What's the network of bosses above you and around you? Um, what is his or her perspective of the organization, of the problem that you face, of the competition, of the market? Try to put yourself in your boss's shoes and try to understand your boss's perspective, right? Um, what's your boss's view of the organization you just took over, right? Um, you might find that uh, you're surprised and it might be worth uh, asking that question, right? Um, I remember my first day on the job at uh, uh, when I was at Northrop, I was actually running a program with a client that was uh, 4,000 miles away. And I asked my boss, at that time it was an executive VP in charge of program management, what do you think of this client? And I thought he was going to tell me this is the most important client in the business, that this client was the most important thing we've got 
um, in the entire building. And I was like amazed when he told me the exact opposite. <laughs> in fact, he told me these, this customer, this client is driving me crazy. He's nickel and diming us, right? I kind of wish they would go away. Um, and I hope you can uh, manage with that in mind. And you know, th that, those two sentences made a huge difference for me. And I was very glad I asked what uh, my boss's view was, right? What are your goals? How are you going to be measured, right? How does your boss measure your success, right? It's worth knowing, especially as early as you possibly can. What problems has this group experienced? You just inherited not just the group and not just the people and not just the goals and the work plan, you've also inherited those problems. Uh, and some of them are real and some of them are perceived. And part of your job is to figure out which is which. I don't think anyone's going to give you um, a recipe book that says these are the real ones and these aren't. I think you have to decide that for yourself. That becomes your uh, leadership perspective, your teachable point of view, right? Why were you chosen for this role? Um, some, you know, it's often a good question to ask so that there might be a specific skill that they're looking for from you. Um, it, you know, I, that's a question I wished I had asked because I eventually figured it out over time, but it would have been a lot easier to just know that up front. And then, of course, who are the key stakeholders, right? Your success depends a lot more than just what your boss thinks because your boss is also talking to other people horizontally across the organization about you, about your organization, your, your, uh, your, your role in the, in, in, the, in the place and how it works. So it's important to understand who those key stakeholders are, are and how you are gonna be obsessed and who, how you're gonna be viewed. Financials, this might be foreign to many of you. Maybe you've never looked at a budget before. So if you haven't, find somebody in accounting to befriend and find, uh, find out how your budget is looked at uh, get a printout of it or get some sort of a, a file that describes your budget and then your actuals against that budget. Um, you know, who established that budget? What were the assumptions behind it? Are you being measured on costs, revenue, headcount? Uh, in my early career, I was managing a cost center. And then later, I'd say when I was maybe in my late 20s, I was run, running a business which had uh, a full income statement attached to it. And that was uh, an amazing experience. But Clearly, with the, the income statement, I was uh, being measured at the bottom line. You know, how much did I return to the company um, against my budget, against my plan? Um, what are your actual costs to date? What's your trend, right? Contrast that with your budget. What drives the budget? What are the key assumptions? How would you financially model your business if you had that chance, right? Um, is your headcount at budgeted levels? How many requisitions are you allowed to have? Are you over budget and do you have to cut back, right? Who approves changes to the budget? And when are budgets set and what is the planning process? That, those last two bullets are questions that I should have asked, um, you know, even my last job at WMS Gaming. It took me a while to figure out the cycle and where you are in the cycle of, of uh, executing against your annual budget and establishing those new budgets. So. You know, when is your chance in the year to actually adjust your budget assumptions and your budget and uh, your budget model, right, if your financial model? So these are uh, <clears throat> questions that you need to ask <clears throat> early on in my mind. So there's a lot more you can say about all of this stuff that's, you know, frankly, why we have a course in finance, we have a course in accounting, so that you can do a deep dive and understand what an income statement is, what a balance statement is. You should be getting, in my mind, at least a monthly budget report where you can compare your actuals to your, to your budget and then see what adjustments you might need to make, right? Don't be afraid to deal with issues. And early on, don't be afraid to ask uh, silly questions because I think it's better to ask those early <laughs> than to ask them later. Um, HR, right? Something that we often forget, right? In the U.S., we view HR very differently than how it's viewed overseas. In the US, HR is often a, um, an extension of the law department, kind of a, a part of the general counsel's office, or at least implementing the policies of the GC. Uh, I would say the first thing you should do in HR, from an HR perspective, when you take on a group, is to review all the performance reviews and the rankings of your staff. Do you have a good team? 
Do you have a team that's well uh, regarded and well compensated? Look especially for time and grades, salary position and grade, and training backgrounds. Um, of course, it makes sense to sit down with each of your direct reports and get that firsthand from them, but I don't think you want to necessarily ask people their uh, time and grade per se or their salary. Those are things you can look up. But I'm sure people would love to share their, their background, their educational background, their training, their experience. Some organizations have a very formal 360 feedback process. Review what that said, especially feedback from peers. I would also review reports from your staff, things that have been written down about projects, about um, you know status uh, across the board so that you have a sense of both how your staff communicates, how they view the organization and uh, what, their, what their strengths are. You can start to see that in their writing. Get some, uh, get some feedback from peers in the organization about uh, not just the organization, but who works in it, who your direct reports might be. <clears throat> okay, so payroll. Kind of an extension of the financial discussion, but is everyone on your payroll budgeted? You have budgeted headcount that's not yet on board. What offers are outstanding? What are the pay grades of the people on your staff? These are uh, key questions to ask or get answered, I guess, one way or the other. Uh, paid time off. Do you have a way of tracking that? You know, where are people in their PTO cycle? Uh, where are they when it comes to vacation time? Um, is everything coordinated so that you don't have your entire organization taking vacation at the same time, right? And is this factored into the work plan for your group? So it's amazing how often our work plans do not include very basic things like, gee, schedule time off or vacations that are very foreseeable, right? This last and bullet is the most difficult. Mark, I was is, just gonna chime in. We had a question uh, in the chat box about uh, specifically what is a 360 feedback process? Ah, okay. It's a good question. If you haven't experienced it, it's when uh, usually HR coordinates a feedback, a formal feedback of your peers. So um, literally asking for feedback on your behalf and supplying you that data not just up and down the organization, but across the organization. So anyone and everyone you work with uh, would be asked to fill out a 360 evaluation, right? Um, and then the last bullet, like I said, is probably the most difficult, right? Our job descriptions and pay grades all in alignment, meaning do you have people that are working beyond the JD? Are they working beyond their pay grade or perhaps not living up to that pay grade? Um, and do the JDs really, um, are they properly compensated uh, or has perhaps time gotten the better of those job descriptions and they need to be upgraded and they need to be aligned? Um, a work plan. I would think that every organization would have a work plan, but it's kind of surprising how often they don't have published work plans or documented ones. So what projects are you staffed and which projects are not staffed in your group? What are people assigned to? Um, what's the next project on the horizon? And what's the project you're finishing up? Um, does the work plan align with the realities of how you're staffed and budgeted? Uh, are the assumptions in the work plan in alignment with reality, right? How does your group's roadmap fit into the higher level organizational roadmap? Hopefully you were hired because you knew some of these answers, but if you don't, this is certainly something you need to talk to architects, talk to the, um, I guess your, your peers, right? As well as your boss to try to understand how, what's the big picture here, right? How does your project or your set of projects fit into the, the grander revenue scheme of things, right? What's your current status, right? I remember distinctly uh, uh, my first meeting with a client at uh, Northrop, I literally had, um, maybe a half a day's notice, if that. And uh, I literally, it was almost the first day on the job. And, and here's the, the client grilling me about the status of a unit under test in the reliability lab. The irony, or the I guess the good fortune was that I had walked past that lab on the way to my office and I talked to the engineer and I had a full scoop on exactly what was going on down to the latest failure, what the root cause of that failure was and what we were going to do to fix it. When I finished briefing the client, this was literally the first time I'd ever talked to him, and he's asking me for status, 
I uh, gave him such detailed status. He, he paused and he said, well, Mark, congratulations. I think we're in good hands. Welcome aboard. So was he testing me? Absolutely. Did I pass the test that day? I think I did. And um, is it in your best interest to be prepared at all times? Absolutely, because uh, you never know when you'll be tested. Um, and then lastly, you know, is there a roadmap for long-term direction setting in your group? You know, where are you going? Both with product, technology, resource, tools, environmental aspects, everything associated with your roadmap, you should have some sort of uh, directional understanding and some rationale behind it. Do you have a client? Um, many of you do. I'm sure some of you do not have a client. Do you know their expectations, right? What's the status of your client? Do you have proposals in the pipeline? Are there current items under contract? Are you delinquent on anything, right? Um, what's your possible new proposal in the future, right? What are they looking for that they haven't gotten? Um, my sense of negotiations with my client was that almost every day he was he was asking me for things that weren't in the weren't in the spec weren't in the contract and uh, in turn there were things i needed so it was really kind of keeping track of the stuff that he was asking for and look, keeping track of the stuff i was looking for and then when the time came matching those two things up trying to create some sort of a deal where you know give me this i'll give you that and uh, all will be even because we tried to avoid uh, you know, changes in the dollars because that was difficult on both sides. And then what are the expectations of your client by your management, right? Um, what are they expecting? So quality, work product and work process. Is there a measure of quality and consistency? How do you stand in your organization with that? Are you uh, delivering what people are expecting? Do you track and control design changes? And what's the process for that? At uh, almost every company I worked at, if we didn't have a change control process, I put one in. And those processes really put your finger right on the uh, um, on the jugular, if you will, right on the, the pulse of the organization. Because frankly, if you don't control changes, they're probably gonna be controlling you, right? Are all the products properly documented? Are you proud of that documentation, right? If there's a build process, how consistently is your product being built to that process, right? Are there tools and measuring equipment and are they controlled and calibrated? Is there a process model or procedure that your team is following, supposedly or in reality, right? Is your process well-defined, documented and key performance indicators, KPIs, are they created? Do you know what they are? And how do you track against that? So these are kind of the process management steps that we go through in a typical process engineering class here on campus. We both uh, simulate processes, we characterize processes, and in some cases we provide tools to help uh, our students automate processes. So all three are what we try to embrace in my process class. Next up is governance, right? So. Uh, how do you hold people and teams accountable? This is a very kind of uncomfortable topic for people. Um, sometimes it's as easy as simply asking, how are things going? Um, where do we stand on that deliverable from last week, right? Do you hold meetings with your team? Is it meant for accountability or is it more focused on communications and alignment? Um, so it gets back to, I'm sure you're being held accountable by your boss. Is there a way that you're comfortable with that helps you hold your team accountable. Um, and then how are decisions made in your organization? Is there some sort of a process for prioritizing, for choosing projects or, or deselecting projects? How is uh, decision-making allocated amongst team leads and, and project managers, right? Is the project manager um, a heavyweight, as we would say in the textbooks, or is it more of a lightweight project manager? Uh, is it more of a coordinator function? what is the role of the functional manager versus the project manager, right? And in my classes, we spend quite a bit of time talking both about that and the role of the sponsor, right? Do projects have proper sponsorship, right? From senior leaders. How are we doing for time, Steve, okay? I can't hear you, so I'm hoping you can yeah. hear me. <laughs> yeah, we're doing, we're doing okay. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll keep going. 
uh, some revelations from the trenches, right? This is, um, these are things I learned, kind of little aha moments in my career that just kind of struck me that, and, and some of these, I, I apologize up front, some of these are going to seem painfully obvious for those of you that have lived through it, but others of you have not. So, you know, the first bullet was simply, you know, we try to hire people and, and kind of affiliate with people that are just like us, right? Uh, and the truth is, they're not just like you, right? And that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing, but everyone is different. And the, the more you learn about them, the more you realize these differences, right? I remember trying to um, promote somebody. The irony was he was one of the first employees I had that was maybe 10 years older than I was. And I assumed that he was just like me, that he wanted to be promoted the same way I wanted to be promoted. And he smiled, he gave me this kind of uh, funny grin, he leaned forward and he said, Mark, I'm not interested in promotion. I'm not even interested in making more money, right? And these are the things I'm interested in, boom, 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 he laid them out. He was more interested in paid time off. He was more interested in having an enjoyable vacation and following his hobbies. And um, I had no idea. So don't make the assumption that like I did, that everyone is just like you, right? The second bullet, you hire people for their strengths, right? We tend to want to fix people for their weaknesses and try to offset that or maybe correct them. And uh, you may learn over time that those are very difficult things to change. So you want to leverage their strengths instead of uh, wallow in their weaknesses, right? It's your job to leverage those strengths, right? And it's your job to either mitigate or manage the weakness you're probably not going to fix people. So try, don't necessarily go in there thinking you're going to fix people. In that sense, being an engineer and being a manager can be very different. As engineers, we want to fix broken things, right? Uh, you're not going to be able to fix uh, a lot of the weaknesses you see in people. You can provide them training, some guidance, perhaps some advice. Uh, coaching is always a good thing to do, but you're probably not going to overcome fundamental weakness, right? You're not here to become the most popular person in the building. Um, if you are, you're probably not going to be that effective. Uh, people don't necessarily respect amiability if that's all you have, if that's, if that's the only thing you bring to the party. Um, if all you can say is, I brought the best donuts to the, to the meeting, uh, people are not going to necessarily respect that, right? And at the same time, people say, is it okay to be friends with your staff? And, and my response is generally no. I think um, you have to keep some sort of distance, if you will, with your staff so that uh, you can look at them objectively and they can look at you objectively and you don't have to kind of intermingle this uh, idea that I need to be friends with everybody. Um, I, you know, it's worked for me and I suspect it'll probably work for you as well. Recognize that different people are motivated by different approaches. Different, uh, different ways of learning, different ways of being uh, enticed to work on a project. It's your job to learn what motivates each person. Um, I'll never forget my boss in my last job said, Mark, I know exactly how to motivate you. All I have to do is say, we need help. We need help. And that alone would literally get, get me all excited. I'd want to jump in and be the first person to help. Um, and you know that doesn't work with everybody, but she knew that it worked with me, right? Some, some terms that I use, especially in my project management class, is this term called situational awareness, right? And it comes out of the military, uh, but it basically means understanding the terrain that you are uh, situated in, right? What are your advantages and disadvantages, right? Who are friends and who are foes? Um, you know, what's your current supply situation? What's your current fuel situation? What's your current situation with regard to everything that's going to make you effective and, uh, you know, successful in that engagement, right? Um, it's amazing sometimes how clueless some people are. They have no idea what the situational awareness is, right? I show a movie from um, December 7th, 1941, in the U.S. that's known as... Uh, you know, the attack on Pearl Harbor. The movie is Torah, Torah, Torah. And for the first three to five minutes of the attack, it seems like the American officers and the American military was totally, um, not just surprised, I'd say almost shocked, right? 
they were bewildered. They were staring at the, at, the, at the sky, wondering, what are these airplanes and where do they come from? They literally, for the first three to five minutes, could not recognize the enemy. Uh, they had very poor situational awareness, right? The other aspect would be, do you understand your staff's perspective, right? When's the last time you talked to your staff? Do you, do you feel like they're being honest with you, right? Do you understand your client's perspective and your boss's perspective? If you spend too much time trying to convince them of your ideas, you may not actually be getting the full uh, scoop from them. So you want to make it safe for them to be honest with you uh, for both the good news and the bad news, right? The third bullet kind of threw me off, too, as an engineer, because I always thought that reality was this cold, harsh thing right in front of you. Um, and it was physical and it wasn't really debatable. But I think, you know, whether it's politics now or whether it's, um, you know, the workplace, perception of reality is just as important. And there's so many different percep perceptions out there that you need to understand them, right? Your job is to fix or prevent problems. Keep those projects on track, right? And these problems could be real or they could be perceived. But just because they're perceived doesn't mean that they're not going to hurt you or impede you from success, right? This last bullet has cost people their jobs for not understanding this, right? Um, meet your teams and your people where they are, not where you think they should be. And what I mean by that is you might have been trained um, to have some sort of idealized view of how an organization should work. It could have come from a textbook, a classroom, um, a maturity model like the SCI. And it could say these are the things that you're supposed to have, right? But you really can't teach calculus to a kindergartner, right? You cannot get people who don't understand algebra to do differential equations, right? There is a sequence. To maturity, there's a sequence to learning, and you have to walk with people down that path um, in that sequence. I don't think you can skip steps. I can't, you don't think, you can't just wave a magic wand or snap your fingers. Uh, meet people where they are instead of preaching to them about where they should be, right? And I've seen the preachers, I've seen, I've heard them, and oftentimes they do more, um, more harm than good. All right, these six leadership styles, I'm not going to go through them in, in too much detail. I would only refer you to Daniel Goleman. This is from the Adaptive School of Leadership, right? So Daniel Goleman's a uh, professor out of Harvard. He's written extensively about um, these six styles of leadership, affiliative, coercive, pace setting, coaching, democratic, and authoritative, right? Um, engineers tend to like believe it or not, the authoritative, because they have this kind of authority that comes from expertise, right? And uh, oftentimes we as engineers will listen to the smartest person in the room or the per person who knows the design better than anyone, right? I would say the other favorite for most engineers is pace setting, um, meaning that we work hard, we expect others around us to work hard, we set a pace that we expect others to follow. And uh, it's done often in silence. It's not done by explicit, uh, um, you know, verbal commands or, or any kind of uh, uh, anything but just just literally setting the pace for the work and setting the example for the rest of us. The one that definitely does not work for engineers is coercive. If you've ever known a coercive leader, my suspicion, at least in the U.S., is that it would not be an effective leadership technique in um, an engineering context because engineers are more professional and they tend to uh, have this kind of competition of ideas and coercion is really just a, a use of force force of will right and if it works in, engin in an engineering community it doesn't work for long and the others i'd say are secondary the affili affiliative coaching and democratic styles tend to take a bit of a backseat so last slide, and your, my key takeaway for you, my key message for you is you have to be comfortable as a leader in your own skin, right? Develop your voice. And if you don't know what I mean, um, ask yourself, how comfortable are you in public speaking situations, right? 
how comfortable are you articulating what you believe about the organization, what you believe as a leader, right? What you believe about the team, the mission that you're on, right? And how can you best deliver that message? So if this makes you uncomfortable, that's probably a, a bit good because it's the same kind of discomfort that we have uh, in the program to kind of stretch you into areas that will make you a better better leader. So again, be comfortable in your own skin. The University of Michigan has this thing called the teachable point of view. And uh, that basically says that you should know what you believe. You should know what you, you should know what you know, right? And you should be able to explain it easily and succinctly to others uh, in any kind of context, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or a group setting. So uh, that takes time, I understand. That takes maturity. All of these you know, key takeaways really require that you be a little bit introspective about what you're doing and also how you're doing it. And you know, what does your gut, what does your gut tell you, right? Um, what does it tell you about the way you're doing it and how you can do it better? And with that, I'm thinking I'll take questions. So should I stop sharing here, Steve? Yeah, it, it, you can. Yeah, you can. It, it doesn't really matter in, uh, regarding your sharing, but now we can see you. Yeah, in full video mode. Um, okay. And uh, if if anyone wants to ask a question, you can uh, go and unmute your mic, or or in the chat box if your mic's not working, and I can verbalize it to Mark. They're gun shy. <laughs> They're shocked. They're shocked. They've never heard this before. Or even, and and this is also an opportunity. Um, if any, this is really. Oh, we have uh, we have a question mark. Okay. I couldn't hear anything. Hey, can you guys hear me? This is Yadid. I can hear. Yeah, I'm having some issues with the technical. I can't hear you well. Can you hear me? It's a little garbled. Can you hear, Steve? It's hard to hear. Maybe type it out in the chat window? Yeah. He's he's typing it now. Yazid is typing it out now. Yeah, I got my chat window open too, Steve. So I can... okay, good. Okay. And I should also say, if you know, this is really uh, a webinar with a lot of our admitted students. So if there's any questions about the program too that you want to ask Mark, please feel free. A lot of what I talked about today kind of fits within the realm of leadership. And I think some of these topics are covered to some extent in, in the leadership course, but also the leadership course is a discovery process. You're really discovering about yourself, your styles, trying to get you to be more comfortable in your skin so that you can project that confidence and that, that leadership quality, that kind of elusive leadership quality that people are looking for, right? Okay, I got some questions here. Um, how different are career paths of people who pursue engineering management versus the traditional MBA? Um, I think what you're going to find is that in engineering management, you are uh, you could still become, for example, a product manager, but you'd probably be more on the technical side. You can go into project management or process work. You can become a supervisor of a technical uh, line that's that's producing product. Um, the traditional MBA teaches you skills such as finance and accounting and perhaps even marketing that, um, you know, frankly, the, those are the comfort zone, if you will, of the traditional MBA. And uh, the engineer has perhaps a slightly different path as an engineering manager. So you could still do things like I said, product management. Uh, operations management is a very classic kind of role. Um, and I think you just see a slightly different focus, right? 
and I've seen it. I've seen a crisscross. In fact, our last uh, speaker uh, was the CEO of Shore, who had worked her way up through uh, marketing and sales, and uh, she was an MEM alum. So, I, you know, I don't think it's you know 100% certain per se, but I think there's certain uh, trends that I've seen. Right. Okay. Since I graduated from the program, how have you seen the program change over time? Wow, that's a good question. Um, you have to recognize for about 10 or 15 years, I had stepped away from the program and I pursued my own PhD and a few other things. Um, first of all, the program is taught by working professionals now, people who are CEOs and CTOs. Back in the 80s, this program was taught by um, uh, mostly research professors or TAs. We actually had a lot of grad students teaching. So we've gotten a lot better in terms of the practicality of our teaching the experience level of the instructors, and the rea you know, reality-based, I would call it reality-based education that, that we were delivering. Um, I think the curriculum today is much better thought out. You have much more experiential type uh, of education. It's not just theory, it's a balance of theory and practice. We do things like simulation of running a business that never existed in the 80s, right? Uh, so there's a variety of kind of, I would call them curriculum enhancements. Things like analytics that we dive deep into now. We have um, project management that didn't exist in the 80s, so project management and process management. W what I've tried to do is bring, me and my immediate predecessors have brought the real world of corporate America and corporations in general into our curriculum and into our classroom. Does that answer it, Steve? Or? Yeah. Oh, oh, all right. And, and he said yes as well. <laughs> sure. I mean, I mean, I have to say that uh, the whole idea of MEM evolved quite considerably, right? So instead of taking research professors and bringing them into the classroom 100% of the time or bringing in their TAs um, and dealing with very kind of theoretical topics, we've tried to balance that with practical topics that, I mean, my best feedback from a student is, I took what you taught me last night, I brought it to the job the next day, the very next day, and it made a big difference, right? And Steve's shaking his head because he's probably heard that hundreds of times. Just yesterday. <laughs> Just yes, okay, there you go. Uh, I've heard it myself, uh, if not hundreds of times, at least dozens of times, and I know the rest of the faculty has too. So that's the big payback when a student says, I loved what you did yesterday, it might have seemed basic to you, but I brought it back to work and it made a huge difference, right? There's one thing I didn't mention too, is that we have this thing called the MEMPC, the consortium. So we actually change, uh, we actually work with probably seven or eight other schools, including Duke, Dartmouth, Cornell, Stanford, MIT, uh, USC, uh, Tufts and Purdue. Some of the best schools in the country that also teach MEM. And we were, by the way, one of the founding members of MEMPC. So we brought these other schools in to a large extent. And um, what we find is we're sharing best practices. We're sharing some of the lessons learned. We're sharing things, everything from marketing to curriculum to uh, teacher selection and even uh, student selection, right? How do, you, how do you pick the best candidates? So we're all sharing you know, best practices. Ooh, this is an interesting question. <laughs> Ooh, what is the best way to identify perception versus reality in the market in the workplace? Right? I almost said marketplace. Wow. Uh, believe it or not, this is actually a huge deal, and this is probably what distinguishes um, yesterday's leaders from tomorrow's leaders. Right? Is the ability to say, well, what is real and what is just perceived. I, in, in in MEM, we tend to focus on data. We're very data centered, and we we think that data is the bridge that that bridges that gap. So uh, we can believe a lot of things, and in many cases, it's not based in data. And in our personal lives, that might work fine, but on, in the workplace, uh, your beliefs need to be uh, rooted in data, in analytics, in what we like to think of as cold, harsh reality. So, um, and that's sometimes difficult to 
difficult to grasp. Um, if you don't have the data, then you're basically almost running on a theological basis, right? You're, you're running on people's belief sets. So I'll never forget, we had a problem in the field at Motorola, and I was not an RF engineer, but the problem was an RF problem. And I watched the technicians take a tiny bit of information and try to run in 15 different directions with it. And I stopped them and I said, uh, time out guys, why don't we actually collect some data? And their first reaction is we don't have time for data collection, we have to solve the problem, right? And my answer was, you could be solving the wrong problem, you could be causing other problems, right? So let's stop, take a deep breath, spend 48 hours collecting some data, and let's see if we can solve the real problem. Sure enough, I designed a data collection sheet. We went to the dispatchers and had them fill it out. And the problem that we discovered had nothing to do with what any of the technicians thought the problem was, right? And um, not only do we save money and time, but we saved face because I'm sure the, the customer, the client was getting pretty impatient with us. So I think data is the way to bridge that gap and uh, recognize that you might be surprised what you thought was perception might actually be reality, right? So this next question here says, what drove you to take a change in your career path from a sophisticated engineer to a good professor? Well, in between sophisticated engineer, which I guess I appreciate, I, I'd like to think I was, um, to being a professor was that I was, a leader, I was a manager for probably 25 years, or at least 20 years, director of program management, executive director, running biz ops. And uh, what I found myself doing as a leader was doing almost what I'm doing right now, which is explaining, teaching, uh, trying to listen, trying to respond, and trying to be as real as I could and deal with the issues that were in front of me. Um, and then I decided, well, if I can do that on this scale, maybe I can bring it back to a classroom, right? Um, I also felt that the classroom needed a little bit more reality-based and, you know, corporate-based and, um, you know, a little less theory and a little bit more practice. So I wanted to bring that to the classroom and see if it would work. And so far, I think it has. I've been doing the teaching now for close to uh, 14 years. Since 2001, so maybe it's more like 16 years. But um, yeah, I've been teaching for quite some time, and I think it helps me be a better practitioner. Um, and during those 16 years, I spent a lot of time in industry. I think I became a better practitioner for it. And um, I think my practice informed my uh, teaching. So I think if you talk to any clinical professor, especially in the, say, the medical profession, I hope they would tell you the same thing. Right, that their practice uh, informs their teaching and vice versa. Right? What drove me to do it? I guess that's almost an internal personal thing. I, I guess um, the sense that this is what I was supposed to do, right? And hopefully that's what drives each of us, right? We're doing what we were supposed to do, right? Um, any other questions? Didn't mean to get too spiritual there, but it's not, I mean, so, sometimes we struggle with what we want to do versus what we were actually supposed to do. Uh, it's funny, when I was really young, I was a horrible public speaker. I mean, horrible. And uh, something inside of me said, you know what? You have to overcome this. I had other deficiencies that I didn't think I had to overcome, but this one I thought I did. And I spent 15, 20 years practicing speaking in public from everything from the church setting to a school setting to work settings and uh, I overcame it so I think deep down we all know which deficiencies we have to overcome and uh, that becomes our life mission at least part of our life mission right getting close to nine o'clock I don't see too many other questions you want to prod them again, Steve? See if we can poke more questions out of them. Yeah, I'm looking. I still see ten participants online, so we they're still here, right? 
<laughs> okay. That is right. I'm frequently asked why I choose to study in the U.S. when I'm already 36 years old. Thank you. Well, I got one, in, one more story. When I was 40 years old, I was pursuing my um, Ph.D., and my fellow students were of, of equal age, in some cases older, so we liked to poke at each other. And one of my fellow students poked at me one day, and he said, what is the ROI of your Ph.D.? And he knew I was kind of financially oriented, and most of us thought in terms of ROI, return on investment, right? What's the ROI of your PhD? And for some reason, I got really angry at him. And I turned to him and I said, what's the ROI of your high school education? What's the ROI of your grade school education? What's the ROI of your family? We all make decisions in life. <clears throat> and some of these life decisions have nothing to do with ROI, right? Um, job prospects. Okay, can I share some information on job prospects, something not already mentioned on the sites? Well, I, I'll tell you what I've experienced working with um, you know, young MEM students and, and, and watching them uh, pursue their careers. First of all, as, as most of you know, in the U.S., it's a highly competitive uh, situation. There's a lot of people going after the jobs, and you have to differentiate yourself, right? And whether it comes from the classroom or comes from yourself, you have to find that passion that's going to connect you to that interviewer, you to that hiring manager, right? And it can't be that, well, I know what your product line is. It's got to be, this is why I believe your product line makes a difference, right? Um, I've seen students who worked on that energy project with Schneider Electric last summer. And the one that got the job in the energy industry was the one who was passionate about energy, clean tech energy, and what he learned in that, and not just in the classroom, but working with the client, solving the problem. He had a great story to tell, and he was excited and passionate about it, right? So I, I guess what I can say is it's highly competitive out there in the U.S. for all sorts of jobs, including engineering management. You have to differentiate yourself, and I think one good way is to is to kind of dive deep, right? So. MEM is about kind of the horizontal, right, engineering management, but also being a technical expert in at least one area so that you have credibility. Back to slide one, credibility, right, in that marketplace. Very few good managers are experts at nothing. You have to be at least an expert in one, one area that's valuable to companies today, right? This last question is, do you under, agree there's not enough of an understanding of the market about the engineering management degree and what's the best way to educate people on the value of this degree, especially with the creation of the consortium. Well, I'll tell you, this is something I've been wrestling with for five years. Um, I agree that engineering management is a specialized degree, as is so many others. I could rattle off 10 other specialized degrees here at McCormick, including analytics, product development, Master's in Project Management, Master's in Robotics, Master's in Biotech, Master's in Information Technology. Every one of these is specialized and is, cannot be compared to the MBA in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's a little like comparing, I don't know, a, a fast food franchise to uh, a, a, a small gourmet restaurant, right, that specializes in a very particular type of cuisine. Um, there are probably a hundred times more MBAs in the world and a hundred times more MBA programs in the world than there are uh, MEM programs. And I acknowledge that. We'll never have the brand equity of an MBA. On the other hand, um, what makes it so ubiquitous could also potentially make it a commodity, right? So everyone knows what an MBA is and what an MBA program is, but the fact that they're everywhere might have diluted its value. So I would just leave it at that. Um, you know, the same thing happened in my PhD program. Does anyone understand what a PhD in org development is, right? Uh, every PhD is specialized. And I think to a large extent, 
having a commoditized master's degree is unusual. And most master's degrees are specialized, at least they have been historically. It's the MBA that's the exception. It became ubiquitous. And, and Mark, just for uh, being mindful of time, and, I, and I've had people side chat me saying they have more questions. Why sure. don't, if, if you have side questions, why don't you email me directly and I can forward them to you, Mark, um, sure. and kind of, kind of get, if there's uh, general themes, kind of organize them. But right. uh, we can we can end the discussion here. It's been an hour, and I, I do want to be mindful of time, and I'll also send out the recording to everyone. Um, what do you think, Mark? That work? That works fine for me, unless there's something that's absolutely pressing. I mean, I'm open to that. But uh, I would do want to thank you all for for sticking around for the hour. I can tell you that this is probably a different kind of discussion than what you would have had in a classroom setting here. Classroom settings here, we probably would change the modality every 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, you'd have a lot more dialogue. This would turn out to be mostly a monologue. Um, and you would have a lot more, uh, if you will, case study type you know, content brought to the classroom so that you can all reflect on the same kind of problem and solution in front of you. So um, as practical as this was, I'm hoping it was practical. Um, I think our, our classes are equally practical in different ways and probably in a deeper dive kind of way. But I hope this was kind of a, um, what can I say, kind of an introductory uh, discussion on some basic concepts of what engineering management should be. And I hope you found it uh, useful. So thank you all. Thank you, Mark. And hopefully we'll hear from everyone soon. Okay, take care. Have a good Bye. evening or morning, whatever it is out there. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.